Hi, Mystery Recapped here. Today, I am going to explain a Canadian comedy film called No Men Beyond This Point. Spoilers ahead, watch out, and take care. At the beginning of the movie, we are introduced to a 37-year-old man named Andrew Myers. He happens to be the youngest man on Earth. Father Ermano Bassi is also one of the few men alive. He tells us how the extinction of the male species first started. The father has been a priest ever since he was a teenager and was familiar with the concept of a virgin birth when it all started. Before the crisis, every year about three or four women claimed to have gotten pregnant without sexual intercourse. It was regarded as a miracle and one timely event by the church, even though scientists didn't agree with it. But everything changed in 1953, when in a single year, 67 women came forward claiming that they got pregnant, even though they were virgins. At the time it first began, many people followed Christianity, which validated virgin births as miracles. Science couldn't prove if the claims were untrue, because there were no DNA testing methods then. The people only had access to blood tests that proved if someone is not the father, and there was no way to confirm if the child had a father at all. When it all first started, people believed that, by nature, a baby can only be born when a sperm fertilizes the egg. So, even though many women were coming out with their stories, the only logical conclusion seemed to be that they were all lying. One of the first women who experienced fatherless pregnancy was Helen Duval. She is currently over 60 years old and is finally sharing her story. In 1953, Helen was a young married woman when she got pregnant. Back then, there were no pregnancy tests, so she was in utter shock when the doctor announced her pregnancy, because she and her husband hadn't had sex in over a year. The couple went for a second appointment to see if the results were incorrect, but they came out positive the second time as well. Helen's husband left her because he thought she cheated. She doesn't blame him as anyone logical would have thought the same. There was no other explanation for the situation she was in. Over the years, she told her story to a lot of people, but the harder she tried to convince people she was telling the truth, the crazier she sounded. Eventually, she too started to believe that she was crazy. It wasn't until 1988, when a DNA test was developed, that people finally believed her truth. A TV interview from 1945 shows us a man talking about fatherless birth claims. He says that the thousands of women from around the world coming forth with such claims are all lying. According to him, women are prone to hysteria by nature, which means that they are copying each other to create this trend of false births to hide their mischievousness. Even when the trend began to grow to a larger scale, the world leaders, who were all men at the time, ignored it, mostly because they couldn't handle the fact that they weren't needed for procreation anymore. As time went by, the more women came forth with fatherless pregnancies, the more men disregarded their claims. Because of this, women began to harbor anger towards men that was soon going to change the course of human history. Then, Sister Isabella came along. She was a nun who was living in a convent in northern Spain, where men were strictly forbidden from entering. But to Isabella's dismay, she got pregnant one day. The church, which was run by men, wanted nothing to do with Sister Isabella and disregarded her completely. So, she and the nuns came together and protested. This triggered the women all around the world who had been suppressing their anger until then. In 1954, Women United Rally came to the streets of Washington, D.C. The men in power tried to calm them by saying that the scientists are still trying to understand how this phenomenon can be possible. But the protests didn't stop there. Women had had just about enough of being called liars. The working women stopped going to their jobs while housewives stopped looking after their families. They joined hands and rallied in the streets. A clip from 1955 shows us that Helen Duval's husband had come looking for her, wanting to take her back as his wife. However, Helen had come to a realization by then. She didn't need him for anything in her life. He can make his own damn dinner from now on. Soon, women all over the world realized that the men's primary job was to help them procreate, and without that, they are of no use. As the number of fatherless pregnancies went up, the number of sexual pregnancies went down rapidly. Science finally came up with a reasoning for the asexual pregnancies that were so wildly debated. It turned out that women had evolved into asexual beings with time, meaning that their eggs could create all the genetic materials that are required for childbirth. 
The process of reproduction is called parthenogenesis. As time passed, babies reproduced sexually became rarer. When scientists looked into it, they found out that eggs in women's bodies had stopped receiving sperm. Even if sperm was injected into the egg, it died instantly, making sexual reproduction impossible. In addition, because of the lack of Y chromosomes, every child that was born as a result of parthenogenesis was a woman. Now, the male species was on the verge of extinction. In 1965, Eleanor Hamilton became the first woman American president in history. All this took was for all of the men to die. As time passed, the power dynamic shifted and more women started being seen in powerful positions. Things started to change when the government introduced the worker replacement program, according to which every man who holds a powerful position in any institution had to be re-evaluated to see if they are actually fitted for the job or they got it because of their male privilege. Eleanor called it the weeding out technique. Now if they can weed out nepotism and psychopaths, the entire workforce will be gone. Because of the law, hundreds of men started to lose their jobs and go homeless. The agitated men all moved to the woods in the countryside, waiting for women to realize their mistakes. But by the mid-1970s, it was clear that women do not actually need men to survive in any aspect of their lives. Some men began to return to society and take mediocre jobs, while others stayed on their ground and started protesting. The leader of men, Darius Smith, claimed that their organization wants respect and position back because women have done enough injustice. By 1975, women represented over three quarters of the population of Earth. Because of this, all women's menstrual cycles began to synchronize and a new phenomenon called menstrual synchronization was discovered. I thought this was a thing already. Soon, the world was united into one and governed by an international organization called the World's Council. The government overthrew several military projects because they weren't needed anymore after world peace was established. They also stopped funding NASA and focused on building a cleaner and safer environment on Earth by developing electric cars. To provide men with proper accommodation, the government created sanctuaries all around the world and asked all the male population to move there. Men were provided proper nutritious food, shelters, and entertainment in the sanctuaries and were asked to confine themselves in those particular areas. At first, the men protested the idea but didn't do much when the sanctuaries were established and they started living a quality life. At present, Darius Smith still claims that the men are only planning their attack in the sanctuaries and have not accepted the idea at all. When technology develops, people start to research the cause of asexual reproduction being possible. While science declares it as evolution, some people believe that a comet passed the Earth closely in 1952, and nine months later, the first asexual baby was born, which means that the comet had something to do with the transformation. Finally, it's been confirmed that women are aliens. However, the theory is claimed to be only a rumor. Currently, 37-year-old Andrew is the youngest man on Earth. He works as house help for a family that consists of only women. The couple, Iris Balashev and Tara Ganger, have appointed him to help them take care of their daughters. Andrew says that he doesn't feel special for being the youngest man alive because it has always been like that for him. His boss, Iris, says that Andrew is a delightful housemaid and is very good at his job. She likes him mostly because he is way cheaper than a female housemaid. She also believes that his influence will be good on her children and grandchildren because they will be able to live as the last few women who have male influence in their lives. Andrew's other boss, Tara, isn't very fond of him because he has a penis and because of his closeness to Iris. Iris paints Andrew a lot, which she claims is for artistic purposes, but Tara doesn't get the point. When the children go to the field for their football match, they bring Andrew with them for help but he is only allowed to stay on the sidelines. While waiting, Andrew meets two men, who are of course older than him. They too are house help for another family of girls. Their chat is disrupted by a teenage girl, who reminds them that a gathering of more than two men is illegal. The guys quietly follow her orders and separate. One day, while Tara and Iris are in an interview, telling people what it is like living with Andrew, Iris says that she likes Andrew a lot, as the conversation goes further, it is clear to Tara that her parenting partner is attracted to Andrew. She asks the interviewer to cut the cameras and storms off. When Iris is alone with the interviewer in the kitchen, she admits that she and Andrew have fallen in love with each other. 
She rushes outside to see him, and the two get into a heated discussion. But things get more interesting when they kiss. The kids watch them from nearby in utter shock because they have never seen anything remotely sexual between a man and a woman. Tara witnesses this and sends the kids back into the house. Meanwhile, the leader of the men's extremist group, Darius, comes forward with his claims that they are being fed food mixed with estrogen so their sexual urges would be suppressed. The men from the sanctuary go on a hunger strike, but it only lasts for a day and a half. Darius pretends that they have decided to keep eating the food so no one forgets what the men are going through in the sanctuaries. After being found having an affair with his employer, Andrew's work permit is revoked and he is sent to a sanctuary in Vancouver. Oh no, not Canada. He lives there for a while, but his mind and heart are back at the house. He cannot get Iris out of his head even for a second. The other men living with him have given up because they do not have any reason to want to go back to society. But Andrew is always thinking of a way to escape. He somehow manages to send Iris a letter and calls her to meet him outside the sanctuary. Then, one night, he escapes and finally reunites with her. The two have nowhere to run and they believe that their love is valid, so they hold a press conference instead. When they logically explain their case to the people, women start becoming more open to the concept of helping men from becoming extinct. People protest, demanding the government figure out a way to help men. Their efforts paid off when Iris and Andrew are legally allowed to get married. With a lot of scientific research, Iris is able to become pregnant with Andrew's child. Scientists disguised the XY chromosomes in the sperm to make it seem like XX, and hence, Iris gets pregnant. The movie ends as Andrew says that he doesn't want the child to be a girl, and Iris looks at him in disappointment. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.